Buonasera a tutti, welcome everybody, welcome to the new webinar from uh, Health Science Department. Uh, and this evening we have uh, with us uh, Sébastien Nomad from the University of Saclay from Paris in France. And uh, Sébastien is one of, uh, I mean, of our best friends in, in Italy working with uh, Argon Argon Dating uh, and uh, in particular working on the ages of uh, Italian volcanism, but in, especially in relation to the old, the, the, the problem, the aspect of uh, stratigraphic uh, and paleontological aspect of uh, uh, argon argon dating. So I think uh, the, um, this webinar gave us the, the, the very nice opportunity to show how improving of the argon argon methods, especially using a very good material like uh, the product of uh, Italian volcanoes can help uh, in solving many issues on uh, quaternary geology, but also in particular, in this case, in uh, archaeology and in particular for the lower Paleolithic. So I think Italy is one of the best archives from many point of view to attempt to put in a, in a, a geochronological uh, framework many aspects of uh, Quaternary evolution, including paleoclimate, uh, including stratigraphy, including volcanic activity, but also the relation between environment and man in the deepest time you can investigate. So Italy is probably represented, and all the area downwind to Italy can represent extremely important area where to address many questions of quaternary geology, thanks to the improvement of uh, argon argon methods. And uh, many of you know very well Sebastian Nomad but I'm pretty sure he's one of the most important collaborators of us in study of quaternary deposits in Italy. So I think uh, I leave uh, uh, all the time to the presentation or, or to Sebastian. Just remember a couple of things. First, please uh, switch off your camera and your microphone just to avoid uh, a noisy and just to improve the, the connection. At the end of the, um, the presentation, there is the possibility for the people who is connected with Teams, maybe there is other people connected to YouTube, uh, to make to make a questions. So please uh, uh, switch off your um, your microphone and ask to to make a questions. It's also possible to make uh, questions from YouTube just per to write just to write questions and and we can try to read and then eventually pass to the, the um, to Sebastian in case. So uh, let me uh, thanks once again uh, the support from uh, our technical laboratory of informatics from the University of Pisa, in particular also this evening, uh, Bernardo Carmina, who is supporting us in all the technical aspects from the organization and the production of this webinar. It will be possible, all this uh, webinar will be mm, recorded and then can be also seen in our YouTube channels if someone is interested and, and so on. So this also give a, a very important uh, opportunity and very important archives to uh, to see again in case our our webinar. I think, Sebastian, you can start. I Thank you, Thank you so much for your for you to accept our invitation, so, and then the screen is yours. Okay, thank you, Jenny. So let's uh, say hello to everybody and thank Jenny for the opportunity to present this work. So we'll share the screen right now. It will take a little bit of time. Take a little time. So do you see now everything? No. Yes, it's starting. OK. It will come. <laughs> yes. OK. So now you can all uh, you can use all the screen. Yes. So it should be OK now. So can you see the first slide? No yet, at least at least a bit. 
So it's probably slow, it's moving. Everything was okay when uh, when we start <laughs> before. And now, of course, it's uh, there is some problem. We cannot see too well. Uh, okay, no, no yet. Do you see things now? I see the screen, but we need to 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 see all the presentation to all the screens. Should be a full screen now. Bernardo, do you see all? Uh, no, 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 no. It's not uh, full screen. It, it is for me. One monitor or two. Did you choose the the desktop or? I I mean. Yeah, you have to to click. Okay, click there. Yes. Click and go to the full screen. No. Yes. You but see? No. Hmm. Huh. <laughs> no, but you have to share again the your desktop after the, the okay. presentation mode. Try. Okay. So let me. Uh, I will stop the the share. Yeah. Yes. Launch the launch the presentation in the presentation oh, okay. mode, and then share again. Okay. Let's try that. So. Yeah, we see just you. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm trying. <laughs> Is it working have right you, now? Uh, have you launched the presentation or not? Yes, the presentation is launched. You okay, so if you press on the share in your desktop, there is uh, several small windows, and you have to choose the presentation one. Oh, I see, okay. So is it working now? Yes, yes. wonderful. Okay, it's sorry okay. about that. So let's start it. We are a bit late now. So um, I will start to talk about the argon argon method, and after I will uh, illustrate what we can do with this method, uh, especially on archaeological sites. So first of all, a little bit of uh, uh, history on the, the method itself. Soon after the discovery of radioactivity, the potassium is demonstrated to be also radioactive. It's, it was in 1907. Soon after, just before the, the Second World War in 35 and 37, uh, it was discovered that potassium fully was the, uh, the radioactive material and that it decay into argon. Uh, that will eventually allow to date rocks. Uh, it was just after the Second World War in 1948 that uh, Aldrich and uh, Nier uh, determined the first potassium argon age. And uh, in the 50s, uh, Nier, also the, this is the guy here, Nier, uh, determined the first 40-36 uh, ratio composition of the atmosphere. And it is one of the stuff that is the main uh, ratio we measure for argon argon. If you go further in time, in 61, one of the first applications of this potassium argon method was to demonstrate the antiquity of hominids. In fact, it was a paper of Leakey. Um, in 62, uh, a very obscure paper uh, re written in the Icelandic outlined the argon argon method, but it was only in 66 that uh, Mary and Turner first date a rock using the argon argon method. And finally, I would like to 
to show you this guy here, so this is Gun Turner and this mass spectrometer that measures some of the first argon argon dates. And in the 90s, that was the revolution of our uh, method. Um, the higher sensibility of the detections and, and better mass spectrometer allowed to date single crystals, allowing to date accurately tephra and especially exclude xenocrystic contamination. And that was the big deal for us. And you will see later on why. So the method itself is based on the decay of potassium 40. Sorry. It is slow. The decay of potassium 40 into two different isotopes, the calcium and the argon. The only one that is used is, in fact, this branching ratio here from potassium to argon. The half-life of this reaction is 1.26 billion years. So it's very long. It's allowed to use this technique, this radiometric technique, for a very large period of time. Now, with time, of course, the potassium will uh, decay, and the argon and calcium isotope, the Current product will increase with time. This is the equation that is here, show you uh, how we calculate time based on this couple of isotopes. So this is the time, this is the decay constant, and this is the ratio between daughter and parent products that we want to measure in our rock. So how do we determine the quantity of uh, retrogenic that have been formed since the eruption? First of all, before the eruption, uh, the system is open, so we cannot date magmas, for instance. But as soon as the eruption occurs, the rock or the minerals uh, isotopic ratio in terms of argon equilibrate with the atmosphere. The atmosphere ratio is 298.56. So when you collect the rock and you extract the gas inside and measure it, by measuring the quantity of argon-40, the concentration and of, of the 36, the total that you have in it, you just have to subtract the atmospheric one. This is the equation that you have right here. So it's a simple uh, subtraction between what you have in the rock and what was supposed to be at T0. The hypothesis made here is that you have an atmospheric composition at T0. We will see that it's important to check that particular uh, matter. How did we determine now the potassium, so the parent product? So the argon, argon method is a special variant of potassium argon. It means that the potassium 40 concentration is not measured directly like potassium argon, but it's made by a form of neutron activation. How do we do that? We irradiate samples and transform 39 potassium into 39 argon using a neutron capture. As the ratio between 39 potassium and 40 is constant, since the nucleosynthesis is 4.56 billion years or even longer. Potassium-39 is a proxy for the parent product. And then the 39 argon produced is directly related to the parent isotope. However, it is not a simple task because it's impossible to determine the 39 argon concentration produced directly from the nuclear reactor. So that's why in 1968, Mitchell defined the quantity J, which is so-called the flux uh, factor. This is the way it is written. So J is determined by analyzing minerals of known age, which are known as flux standards. So we measure in it this ratio here by mass spectrometry from minerals that are co-radiated with our samples are unknown by after injecting this ratio into the same equation I showed you earlier, it is possible to calculate an age by knowing the quantity of 39 that have been produced into the reactor. So, of course, to do that, we need standards. And uh, recently, uh, lots of work have been done to improve both the precision and accuracy of standards. So you have a whole bunch of standards here. The, that's the standard we use the most. And with two different decay constants, I will come back to that later on. And uh, you will see that the precision of these standards is very high. 
Of course, the age, age and uncertainty of these standards are, for most of the people which are not aware of the techniques, think that it's the Achilles standard, the Ben Weber of the accuracy of argon argon, but it's not completely fair for two good reasons. It is easy to recalculate an age, an age based on any given standard, based on an average standard age. Secondly, the standards are used only to determine the parent product, so the 40 potassium. So the argon-argon method is no more relative than other dating techniques using tracers like uranium thorium or uranium lead. The other stuff that are currently, uh, let's say, a problem, is that there is three decay constants that you could find in the different literature, depending on the, the period that have been the, where the, the dating has been done. So we have three of them, Steiger, Min, and Rene. Let's all already forget this one, it's the oldest one. There is no real full uncertainty propagations. So we let with two real decay constants currently in the literature. And who is the best? I would say right now it's hard to say because both of them have advantages and drawbacks. Anyway, most of the stuff I will show you are based on Rini et al. 2011, because I think that's the one that you could have a a better handle on the uh, full uncertainty because it's based on measurements and only measurement, which is not the case for this one here. So how do we really, what is the cooking that we use to extract an age from the tefrali or, or pyroclastic? So it takes a few minutes to take a sample and after back in the lab, you have to save, pick crystals most of the time for tefra. In Italy, it's leucite, uh, anortoclase, or salidine. They are irradiated with the standards nearby. So this is a, a shuttle that is sent to the reactor. So after irradiation, we have to let cool things several weeks. And after, we could extract one by one the crystals and the standards that are loaded in individual um, holes. And then every crystal is fused using a laser, and the gas extracted analyze using a mass spectrometer. Of course, you have data reduction after, but what we produce is something that looks like that. It is a probability diagram uh, that was introduced by Deno and Potts in the 90s. So in this kind of diagram, you have the probability here and you have here the age. Each of these bars correspond to an age of a single grain with its corresponding uncertainty. A single age is extracted from the juvenile populations. The xenocrysts are clearly shown here as older. And we just use a weighted mean of this population. Of course, a weighted mean is a way to, uh, to, uh, to take into account the more precise age rather than the less precise. So this is things that you will see all along. And most of the age I will show you are the weighted mean of this juvenile population in tephra layers or in embryos or whatever. I will show you. So now, this is the light points for the techniques. And after we could go on uh, with the results and applications on uh, archaeology. So the last point is the fact that all the individual edges that are plotted in that stuff are, in, in fact, apparent edges. And we assume that the atmospheric composition was at T0. I mean, the T0, at T0, the rock equilibrates with the atmosphere, but sometimes it's not true. So we have to check that using so called an inverse isochrone that you could see here. And if everything is okay, all the data points fit into a mixing line between the atmospheric composition that is here and the radiogenic pole that is here. In that case, for this data set, the ratio we obtain at T0 is equivalent to a atmospheric ratio. So everything that I will show you, all the edges have been checked for this hypothesis, of course. So let's now go to the real topic of today, because it's, I, I, I think it was important to show you how it was done, because there is a lot of data and lots of time have been put uh, to, uh, to obtain this data. And that's, that's an occasion for, for me to thank all the people that were involved since 10 years in these projects. And especially uh, thanks to Alison and my colleague from the museum and uh, all my Italian colleagues that allowed us to come and uh, take samples on the sites. And of course, I would like to thank 
all the institutions that uh, provide funding for this work. So what's happened during the middle uh, and uh, lower Paleolithic? From, uh, from climatic point of view, it's a period of heavy changes. As you could see before 800 kilo years, most of the climatic variability was in fact uh, locked by an orbital forcing that is uh, uh, 41 kilo years. And between 800 and 450, the mid Prince event, you have variations that become more and more uh, important to be more regulated after 450 at regulated by the 100 kilo years uh, orbital uh, cycles. So it means that after 450, the interglacial become warmer, but the cold stages are becoming longer and more dry and more cold. So during this period in Europe, you have glaciations and warm periods that alternate each other, which means also these have implications on the way uh, humanity needs to adapt to these very variable climatic and environmental changes. Here, I showed you a very uh, synthetic evolutions of the hominid and lithic culture, uh, starting with Homo antecessor, um, uh, carrying mod one tools that are relatively simple. And, and I, I would say first that I'm not a, a lithic person, I'm not an archeologist. So if I use improper uh, terms, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, then uh, after uh, the Bruce Modiama, you have another species occurring and appearing in Europe, which is called Homo heidelbergensis, carrying with him mod two or Acheulean techniques. And as soon as you reach 450, you have a lots of things going on. I will show you also in Italy, you have fire domestications and you start to have tools that are usually associated with Homo neanderthalensis. I mean, more evolved and that need more cognitive abilities. And this is called mod three or Levallois or discoidal. Uh, sh uh, shopping. Anyway, this is a very rough and simple chronology and evolution. And in fact, the establishment of, of an accurate chronology is one of the key to unlock some crucial scientific locks, like what are the modalities of human and cultural morphologic evolutions? We don't know the regression paths or the population dynamics during these periods. And what is the role of the climatic variations on human evolution. This is questions that uh, are puzzling and needs a proper chronological framework. So why do we have problems during this time period? The first problem is the fact that there is a relative low accuracy and low precision of most of the chrono uh, chronometer that are used in archeology span for this time period. And there is really only the argon argon and the U series that have precision that allowed to compare archeological records with paleoclimatic and paleoclimatic records. The other problem is the fact that most of the archeological sites are open air, which means that they are prompt to erosion processes. Uh, there is almost no caves. So it, the U series is, is, uh, is hard to, uh, to do. And uh, the last thing is that there is a few long archeological sequence that have been conserved. It means that it's uh, very hard to have a, uh, at, a, at a single locations of evolution of both the human fossils and of the tools themselves. And the last that I did not, uh, uh, that I would like to mention is the fact that there is not that many human fossils in Europe for this time period. So can the argon argon method and the systematic uh, multi-method approach, as well as Tefos Bergati, be the way to improve these frameworks? In fact, that's what we thought in 2009, and I think we succeed, and I will show you that. And especially this approach where, was very successful in Eastern Africa during the early 90s. And the Italian peninsula is a perfect place to do the same thing. Why? First of all, because there is a huge number of archeological sites from this time period in Italy. The reason is that because there is a lot of tectonic basins uh, and uh, you have uh, a large number of basins that have great records both from the archaeological point of view and from the paleo-environmental point of view. And the last, but not the least, is the fact that there is a lot of volcanic complex that are active between these periods. That, uh, uh, that's why in these uh, sedimentary records and archaeological sites, you have a lot of volcanic materials and tephra layers that could be dated. This is what I showed you here. It's a synthesis that I've done 
and it is a very complex graphic. So I just want you to concentrate on these two uh, areas. This is a compilation of uh, the large inland rights and they are corresponding argon, argon age. And you could see how many eruptions you have over the last 800,000 years. This is another way to see things. This is a probability diagram. Each of these is an eruption, large eruptions. Some of them in red here could be found, in fact, in Palo, uh, in, uh, in, in sedimentary basin all around Italy. And as you could see, there is at least one large eruption every couple of thousand years. So it means that it's, it's an amazing area to, um, to, to create a chronological framework that is uh, strong enough to be compared with climatic variations and paleoenvironmental variations. So since 2009, our group, which is huge in fact, it's, uh, I just calculated this morning, it's about uh, more than 70 people that work in that project. Uh, we successfully dated 22 archeological sites and 55 archeological layers. There is a list of the sites here and their locations. How do we do, uh, what, how do we did that? Two ways, in fact. We could directly date the archaeological, uh, the archaeological remains when they are found embedded into primary volcanic deposits. It's the case of La Poledora that I will show you later, or the footprints of the Debra footprints. So by dating directly these volcanic products, you have an age of an approximation, a, approximative age for the fossil remains. But most of the time, it was an indirect approach, meaning that we have to frame the archaeological layers, like here in uh, San Nicola, between uh, layers that could be dated. It could be primary deposits like this one here or reworked volcanic materials like this one. So we use a systematic stratigraphic approach, which means that we measure a lot of crystals in each of these layers. Also, when it was possible, we realized paleodosimetric uh, dates to cross-check the accuracy of these methods that are less precise, but that's the one that I use all over Europe because it's not always uh, um, volcanic materials. And this is the work of uh, my colleagues from the museum. Uh, I will show you some results and it's, it's pretty amazing what you could do now with these methods. So let's start with uh, the oldest of the sites we studied. So I just choose two sites, uh, particularly uh, because they are one of the few known stratigraphic sequences in Western Europe that have more than 10 lower Paleolithic archaeological layers. This is the Notarchaeico site here and the Valle Giumentina. I would start with Valle Giumentina, which is in the middle of the Apennine. Uh, it's, it's in the Maiella uh, in Abruzzo. So this is a, a sequence uh, which is, was completely exposed in the new digging uh, starting in 2015 by the Ecole Francaise de Rome. And uh, you could see this is a very nice sequence. And uh, it was discovered in 52 uh, uh, by uh, Ranvili. And since uh, 2015, it was it is digged by uh, the Ecole Française, uh, led by Elisa Nicou, uh, Daniel O'Reilly, and uh, uh, Dr. Tagli. You could see a very nice uh, video of this digging here in the, this uh, YouTube link. So we collected along this sequence uh, tefa layers. Uh, we have also some uh, uh, some Malaco. Uh, Malacology that allowed us to give an information about the environment. And uh, all these um, stars, blue stars, correspond to archaeological layers. You can see there is a lot. And we have, and we succeed, uh, we, we have very good success with dating of, uh, of this site, which is now framed between 586 and 456 kilos. You could see the diagram like I showed you. They are very nice. And this is mostly primary deposits. So we were able to put uh, this sequence in phase with paleoenvironmental variations. And what we, uh, we found is that the sequence is, of course, much older than previously thought. It was thought to be about 200 to 100 kilo years. In fact, the 60 meter sequence is a 150 kilo years long record with two climatic cycles between MES 15 and MES 12. What is important here is that the lower paleolithic settlements are found both during glacial and interglacial periods. And some of them are 
even found during um, oscillations uh, uh, during MES-12, which was, let's say, uh, unexpected. Another thing is the fact that each time you have a paleosol, the paleosol is formed uh, by the weathering of the tefa layers. And uh, this happened during MES-13, MES-14, and MES-12 substages. And each and every time you have tools and you have a trace of human occupation, which means that they were coming each time that the, the weather allowed them to come uh, in this area. The other things which is very nice is the fact all the tefas from Valle du Mantina probably come from the Roman province, and in particular the Alban Hill and Stavatini. And we were successfully uh, chemically, uh, uh, we success, we chemically match, in fact, this tefa layer to the Pozzolan and uh, Rosso, and then recently this particular uh, tefa and soils to the uh, Tufo Pisolitico di Trigoria. So it means that it's also a very nice uh, tefostratigraphic record. Let's move to Notar Carico. So Notar Carico, there is two uh, digging. In fact, the first one was from the 80s. It was seized by Marcello, Professor Marcello Piperno. And since the 2016, there is a, a new digging that extends down the section, uh, this, uh, this site, uh, led by Marie-Hélène Moncel from the Museum uh, d'Histoire Naturelle. And this is uh, funded by the Leakey uh, Foundation. As you could see, they recovered down the section much older than previously thought by facing, which is uh, a, a remarkable. So let's uh, start with the old digging. As you could see, we uh, did a lot of measurements. And in fact, the entire sequence between uh, level archaeological F and uh, uh, alpha is framed between 670 and 613 kilo years. It means that all the volcanic material, including this primary deposit from the tefra, come from the Vulture and come from, in particular, the subsystem Topo, San Paolo, Rio Nero, and San Michele. And that all the archaeological layers are, in fact, during MES 16, the cold stage MES 16. Now, if you go to the new digging, it was extending down, and we reach almost 700 kilo years right now. There's 16 archaeological layers covering more than 100 kilo years. This is some examples of bifaces that have been found and published recently in PLOS One by Marie-Hélène Moncel. And uh, as you could see, this is the age uh, uh, that have been obtained by uh, the people of uh, the, the museum, by ESR, and they match what we got in Argon Argon within the facility, which is uh, a big improvement and, uh, and show that this method can be used uh, 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 when you don't have volcanic materials. This is a site also where you find the oldest human remains in Italy, which is uh, here. Uh, and you have also now the oldest Italian bifacial tools that are framed between these two volcanic layers. Let's move to the, some younger sites, but which are also three landmark uh, lower paleolithic sites of Italy. Uh, I would start with uh, Ceprano, Fontana Ranuccio, and Poledera di Secanilo. So the Cepano Calvarium is found in the middle of uh, the Latin Valley. In fact, in more particularly in the Ceprano Basin, together with uh, lots of archaeological sites. There is a, a web of uh, archaeological sites in this area that have been studied by our group and uh, the people of, um, uh, of Roma for the last uh, 10 years. And in fact, in this 10 kilometers square, there is more than 20 archaeological sites. It's just, uh, 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 just amazing. The, this um, fragment of Calvarium was found in 94 by Italo Bizitu and uh, Alberto Segre during a road work in a clay layer. So this is reconstruction of this uh, Calvarium. So first, the potassium argon dating was made in a, in a tefa layer nearby with an age of 1.1 million. The morphology of this Calvarium is very um, uh, archaic. So it was proposed to have an age between 700 and 800 kilo years because the paleomagnetic data showed a normal priority. It was for long considered as the, one of the uh, last common ancestors of European and African and uh, at the middle Pleistocene around 800 kilo years. So what's happened in 2009, Giovanni Mutoni, in one of the core he took nearby, discovered tefa layers 30 centimeters above the clay layers where the skull was found, in fact. 
we dated this, uh, this and we published it in 2011 and we end up with an age for the lucite extracted from this tephra at 353 kilo years, which is much, much more younger. But what we found also, it's a whole bunch of lucites that are extremely old in it, more than one million years old. So what it means, it means that the potassium argon age of estimation was due to xenocrystic contamination, that the shape of calvarium do not belong to an archaic species, but is contemporaneous with Homo aldebergensis, and that it probably uh, dates from the MES 11 or MES 10, uh, so far from previous estimation. So now, discovering is still important because it had an unexpected diversity into the range of variation known to the European population of it. Uh, why Giorgio Manzi uh, wrote a dedicated paper in 2016 about that. Let's move to Fontana Rocio. It was discovered in 76 in a sequence of pyroclastite. It is a unique layer, very rich in fauna. It's, it's a faunal unit, in fact, in Italy. Uh, there is a lot of elephant bones, tools, and four human teeth. This is the stratigraphy of this sequence. This is where the potassium argon was taken that gave this age, which is reported in the literature. And this is where we took the argon argon age. We took also some uh, chemical analysis that was done by Giaggio, uh, uh, Biagio. And it, they, they discovered also during their, uh, um, their survey an unconformity here. So all this sequence is, there is an erosion uh, um, limit and it's stopped by the uh, Tufo Leonato uh, eruption. So this is the age we got for uh, this particular, uh, it's a Lahar, in fact, uh, on top of a primary fall. And we got an age of 407 plus minus two, which matched with Puzzolan Nere, and chemically also, it matched the Puzzolan Nere. I just showed you an age for this uh, Tefa layer uh, coming from another section, but it's uh, chemically a match uh, uh, around 370. But it, what it means, it means that this site is not MES-12, but it was fought before. It's MES-11, in fact. And it was published by Alison uh, Pereira in 2018. Uh, let's go to La Poledra di Cecanibio. It was discovered in 84. It's an extraordinary uh, site. Uh, I was impressed the first time I, I went there. You could visit it and you could go into the uh, Superintendencia uh, Speciale de Roma to see uh, some more pictures. Uh, it's, it's a middle place to see Frigio Palestrian environments that contain uh, a lot of sites. There is 37 elephants that have been found, five in an identical position. And artifacts are in an excellent state of preservation, and they are all found into the Aurelian formation that is well known by people working in the, the Roman province. You could see a general uh, view here. You could see the tusk. Some of them could be more than four meters long. This is one here close by. This is the sequence, in fact. And I, I, will, I will directly tell you that this is big pumices, white pumices, and this is a mud flow. And all the remains are found inside this mud flow. So this is a, 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 a Bos primigenius, a skull of uh, Canis lupus. And this is what's happened. All these animals were stuck in this mud flow uh, a long time ago, you will see that. So what is important about this, this site is the fact that some of the animals that were stuck were butchered by uh, hominids because, uh, because you find fractures uh, referable to human activities. You find a lot of bone tools sticks and denticulates, as well as small tools all around, in fact, the animals. And some parts have been taken. The thing that is also surprising, there is no hand axis found all around this site. So the estimated age before we started the work in 2012 was the Aurelian age between 370 and 390 kilo years. So we took four samples all along the sequence so from uh, three meters down, uh, uh, we found a, a, a very nice, uh, thick uh, pyroclastic deposit. And here, this is the picture of uh, the, the sequence itself. So this is a fluviatile uh, bedded uh, sediment that we took. And we took also uh, several uh, pu white pumices here inside the mud flow. So this is what we obtained from the bottom to the top. So we found that this uh, pyroclastic flows uh, was 411 kilo years that, of course, the fluvial channel revoked a lot of eruption. The youngest one was at 360, so it means that the deposition is uh, probably uh, MES uh, 10. And all the 
pomacy extracted from the mud flow give exactly the same age. You could see we have a lot of measurements here at 325. So it means that there are archaeological layers. There is two archaeological layers, in fact. There is one which have this, uh, we, which have a lots of bones which are, uh, in fact, uh, spread out. Uh, and you, you have, uh, at the uppermost part, um, animals that are stuck into the mud flow. Anyway, these layers have been uh, unplaced following the Tufo di Bellicciano eruption that we here dated at 325, which is also the age of this site. So now let's wrap up and look at uh, the, the synthesis of all these data that we, uh, we have on all these sites. And uh, this is for the oldest periods. This is in red. Each time you have a, an axe that has been found and in, in black where there is no an axis. So after a period of 100 kilo years without any known site in Western Europe, including Italy, it seems that uh, an axis or bifacial, bifacial tools appear at the end of ME17 in Italian peninsula. And what is important is the same thing appear in Northern France. But these tools are not systematically found until MES 12 or 11. This is the recent um, uh, ages that have been uh, given for Moulin Quignon in La Noire, in northern part of France. They are exactly the same that in Mount Archerico, in fact. Let's move to the youngest period, toward the transition to Middle Pleistocene, and to the uh, transition between Middle Paleolithic also, that is usually associated with Neanderthal. And, uh, what we discovered in Italy, uh, thanks to the geochronology, is that the Levallois debitage, and you have ex here an example, Quagado San Michela from Pereto 2015, appears sporadically very early in Italy, as soon as MS 11, so well before Homo Neanderthalensis. It means, it suggests also that the Burgundies have the cognitive ability to do this kind of tools, or at least to test uh, these kind of tools. And finally, something which is typical of uh, Italy is the fact that during the MES 11 to MES 9 period, uh, you have regional cultural tradition based on bone tools, especially in many, many sites of the Latium. And you could see some amazing here, the bifas from Fontana made with a long bone of an elephant. Finally, this is the complete synthesis of what we have so far in Italy that has been uh, modified from uh, Allison uh, um, uh, PhD. So each of these points are, in fact, uh, archaeological layer that is dated. And you could see this amazing Italian record, continuous, allowing to follow the evolutions of the hominid, for, the, for, of the hominid fossils, but also of the tools themselves. <coughs> and what we could see is the Italian record is a reference in terms of chronology, but it's also agree with everything that have been discovered in all Europe. It means that <clears throat> before a period with no sites, we don't know what's happened, there's a sporadic presence of bifaces all around Europe, like in Italy. In Italy, like in the rest of Europe, you have a generalization of the bifas industry starting around MES 13 and becoming common during MES 11. We could see also the transition period from lower to middle paleolithic starting uh, around MES 11, just after the mid Bruce event. What we see also, and very clearly in Italian record, is the increase of number of sites, of well preserved sites, after MES 11 and the mid Bruce event. Is it because there is the population increase, or is it because it is well preserved? It is a question that we still have to work on. Finally, now this is the Italian record compared to the European record. You could see how good is the Italian record compared to the other ones, to the rest of Europe. You could clearly see also this no known sites gap that is uh, puzzling right now. But what is, what is important about the Italian record is that uh, this corpus can be directly tied to the pattern of environmental changes. Thanks to the Tefa layers, you see two examples here. At Fontana and Lucio, the same Tefa layers could be tied directly to the Ochre paleo-environmental record. Or at Valle Jumentina, for instance, the upper part is completely directly linked to the paleo-environmental record, which means that this 
uh, Italian record is a reference and it will improve in the in the next year but the most important is the fact that we could in that case unified records archaeological and paleoenvironmental records what's happened here i have no idea and i hope we will find some sites during this period or it could also mean that we have this hominids um, were extinct and a new wave of new population carrying Acheulean technology arrived in Europe around NES 17. It's a question mark right now, but it's a very interesting topic to work on. So what are the take-home messages? The Italian lower and early middle Paleolithic corpus is the reference now, thanks to the work and dedications of all our team. The argon-argon single crystal laser fusion has proved to be very effective, even to date sedimentary units with no primary deposit, but only rework volcanic events. The third thing is that the Levallois and Discoidal, or mod three tools, as well as regional tectonic level keys, appears after the mid Bull 7, during interglacial NES 11, so much, much well before Homo Neanderthalensis census census stricto, but at the same time, where in fact some morphologies uh, of the Homo Neanderthalensis appear in the uh, Homo Heidelbergensis population. And the last but not the least is the fact that both paleoenvironmental climatic records and archaeological corpus are now dated using the same method. It will allow us to unify these records that were for a long time anchored in a different framework. Finally, just to give you an inch of the future, this is the brand new machine that we were installed a few months ago in, uh, in uh, LSCE in uh, in, um, uh, in an effort with uh, GEOPS, another uh, earth science lab, and this is uh, funded by the Région de France, and this machine is just exceptional with uh, detectors which are so good that the sensitivity is three times better than the machine we used to have, allowing, I hope in the future, to do good science in Italy and uh, date tephra layers, even uh, uh, distal ones that we currently cannot date directly. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sebastien. I think uh, one of the problem with webinar, there, there is no the opportunity to, to see, to hear a very warm claps from, from the auditors. But anyway, it's uh, very clear. And thank you very much for presentation. Maybe you can now show yourself in case. And I will uh, do that. I will do okay. that. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh, sorry, that's a very big. <laughs> Okay. A big face. So you sharing. You are still sharing the. No. 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 I'm not. Okay. Right. Come on. So camera is like... I can switch off my face, and uh, so uh, I think now is uh, we have time for questions. So if uh, anyone want to do some question, just can can switch off his microphone. And then ask, uh, I mean, make attention without uh, of a position between others. And uh, I think there is a uh, many points, very interesting points on this. This a uh, very clear presentation. I don't know if there are um, if there are points or questions from the from the auditors, the audience. Nobody. I'm surprised. Nobody? No, just, come on. <laughs> uh, come on. I, I have some questions for okay. sure. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, I don't know if someone. I mean, you could just uh, share, remove the share of your screen. Thank you. I think uh, I think uh, you you are sharing the screen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You are still sharing the screen. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Is it better? Okay. It's much better. It's much better, <laughs> Sebastian. It's much better than me. <laughs> yes. So um, I have a, a a couple of questions. Uh, yes. And, uh, so one is uh, probably more um, suitable for archaeologists. But when you discuss about the ages of uh, Levallois, yes. and you say they occasionally they found. Uh, what means occasionally? So, because uh, in the production of very large amount of uh, 
of material, there is also the possibility to produce uh, produce product some uh, Levallois artifacts. We actually yes. are not really really uh, uh, an intention of the people. So because when you produce uh, a lot of things, so how is important actually in, so, in, in substance? Uh, for for the for the for that matter, more than twenty percent of the tools that were found in Guado San Nicola, so which is uh, three hundred and eighty kilo years, this is uh, uh, this is clearly uh, Levallois discoidal uh, shop, shopping. Uh, it was in paper in two thousand fifteen. They, they were very surprised to find so much of this material in in this kind of site and so old also. Uh, so I said occasionally okay, it's because there is few other that have been found in La Domagne also. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it means that they, they were present. Uh, they were not widespread. They were just maybe locals or uh, some people may have uh, tried things, but they were already there. That's my point. That's the point so, of archaeology. Yeah. It means that the transition, it's really a long transition toward uh, the, the mod three, the, the transition between lower Paleolithic and up uh, and uh, Middle Paleolithic is not a is not a, a sharp transition. It's something that uh, was like the Neanderthal uh, morphology, something that lasts hundreds uh, uh, and ten thousand or, or more years. So you, uh, I don't know if there are other questions because I can I can continue. Uh, sorry. sorry. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, Sabine. Okay. Uh, I'm Giulia Bosio. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, I have a question about uh, the Tefer stratigraphy. Um, so um, I was wondering if uh, you have, uh, have you tried to use uh, Tefer fingerprinting, like uh, chemical fingerprinting uh, on, uh, on the different uh, ash layers? Uh, in the different uh, archaeological sites, uh, or uh, you have just um, um, you have just done the um, the argon argon dating on them? Okay, so in some Thank sites, you. yes, we have been successful to track chemically and and uh, have a fingerprinting, like in the Tarquerico, for instance. It's uh, it's come from the Vultur. It's pretty clear chemically. Uh, same thing for Valle Jumentina, as I said. There's at least three layers that we were able to successfully tie to some eruptions in the Roman province. The problem in many other cases is that it's in a fuvial, uh, um, in the, in fuvial um, environment. So most of the time there is no glass left. Everything has been uh, altered uh, during, uh, uh, during the, the process of uh, rework uh, of the, the, the minerals or even uh, uh, when you find primary ashes, uh, it was deposited in a, in a marsh environment, so there is a lot of uh, alteration going on. But in some cases, yes, we were successful to track and, uh, and found the origin of the Tefa layers. Sabine Wolf asked uh, asking for a question. Sabine, are you I'm here. I turn on my camera, sorry. Okay, I have some questions regarding the mythology of argon argon dating. It was yes. well. Thank you so much for this wonderful um, presentation. It was amazing. I learned a lot, <laughs> and um, I, I was wondering: Do you see actually any atmospheric ratio changes over time in argon in argon argon? When you, you said that we have this ah. um, ratio, is there? Is I mean, we, we see this, and when we do the C14 datings, where we have constant um, ratio changes over time due so, to so, so, changes in so solar. Let, let, let me uh, let me uh, go straight. Yes, the atmospheric ratio change, but it changed so slowly that for the last two million years, it's impossible to resolve this increase. It was done in in uh, in ice core, but uh, it's it's really really within our uncertainty. It's a uh, it's a 0.001 percent of variations in a million year, so it's not a problem for us, really, okay. for the quaternary uh, chronologists and even for the people uh, looking at the Mesozoic rocks, Mesozoic tefa layers. Or it's it's not a big deal because it's within uncertainty of everything else. Okay, well, great, thank you. And I have one more question. Yes. Um, 
I was wondering how you can how can you date rework Tefra? I was I was thinking that when you analyze the um, argon argon ratio, that um, but the um, the the time of the eruption is trapped in in this ratio. How how can you figure out the um the time between the um initial eruption and the reworking process? So so that's that's why I said we use a stratigraphic uh, approach. It means that in a sedimentary unit, we measure uh, between 20, 30, and sometimes 40 grains. And we look at the youngest population for one particular layer, and we go up like that. And uh, there is so much uh, eruptions and so much product coming into the basin, into the various basins, that usually the layer above have younger crystals, and so forth and so on. So we bracket using the youngest crystal found in each of these layers. That's, that's uh, something like that. So that means you're not uh, um, dating directly the redeposition or the, the deposition. No. So it's like an interpolation somehow. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Between the two youngest population we found in each layer. So yeah. that's why we, we measure lots of crystals. Like in Otarkeriko, we, we, uh, for uh, six meters, we, we measure uh, 10 different layers and each time 30 grains. So it's, it's lots of work. Okay, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Are there any questions? Roberto Surpiz, you have a question. Please, Roberto. Hey. Okay, so sorry, but I cannot switch on my camera because I'm connected by the phone. So it's a, it's a mess. Uh, so uh, thank you for your presentation, Sebastian. And uh, just, a just a technical question. I don't yes. know if I missed something in your presentation due to the difficulties in connection. But uh, I wonder if there, uh, uh, what is the, the, the technical limits of the, of the method? So, I mean, uh, what is the minimum size of the crystals, for example, that you can examine? This, because this is uh, very important for, uh, for us that working with the tephrostratigraphy and technology, for example. So everything depends of, uh, of the composition of your tephra and, uh, and uh, the age. Uh, let's say right now with uh, the, 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 the mass spectrometer we have, the, 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 the most recent one, uh, if you have lucite, uh, you could go down to a couple of thousand years. You could date things that are a couple of thousand years, uh, but you have to work with crystals that are millimetric size. Uh, if you go to the 100 kilo years kind of business with lucite, uh, the limit is maybe 150 microns. There is no problem because there is so much potassium. When you start to go with uh, sanidine, uh, you could pretty much date everything from 30,000 year up to a million year uh, with grains, sanidine grains, which are between 250 and 500 microns. There is enough gas to give an age, but you have to work with a lot of grains uh, because individually, the error bar will be about 10%. Is that okay for you? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Thanks. Are there any questions? And uh, I have a, I have a one, one consideration is just yes. uh, an information. It's a pos po probably it's a, it's a good uh, exercise to insert in your graphs. Also, the lower Valdarno, because in the lower Valdarno, <laughs> There is a, a, a reworked uh, artifacts, lower Paleolithic artifacts, also with beface, not very common, coming from the base of a sedimentary succession with, uh, on top, uh, the Etefra from Vico. It's a Vico mm -hmm. Alpha. I don't remember, Biagio, I don't remember if it's a Beta or Alpha, but anyway, so it's, uh, it's an industry uh, tools coming from. Uh, Stage 12 with the BFAS. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's maybe also to, useful to consider, even if uh, there is no very young uh, research on that, also because most of uh, the the outcrops are now any more visible. The second point, you you made some consideration about uh, the the comparison between electron spin resonance yes. and argon argon dating, and. Uh, but my, my question is, I'm not an expert of uh, electron spin resonance, of course not to, also for argon argon, but and it's mostly depends on the dosimetry, I mean, uh, the, the amount yes. of, of those. So yes. 
in the, in the very strong in, in the volcanic area like like Italy, probably the dosimetry is quite different from uh, from other counts. So I don't understand very well how you can use this to, to test uh, the quality or calibrate the methods also in other sites. Or probably I have misunderstood something. No, no, there are several papers. To, uh, one was oh, okay. published on the comparison between the two, and uh, most of the time ESR on quartz. Mm. Each quartz works. Uh, in any case, we compare within an city, we found the same age, argon, argon, and ESR on quartz. There is more problems with ESR on TIFF uh, because of the leaching processes, and uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, there is problems in Italy in particular because the, uh, there is so much, uh, I mean, it's so much, there is so much radioactivity sometimes that it's hard to tell if it's an early or late uptake. So uh, there is more problems in uh, ESR. UTH than in ESR quartz. Okay. As soon as you have, uh, you, as soon as you have terraces with quartz in it, bleach quartz, and you cannot do anything else than uh, ESR and quartz, it works most of the time. And it's, uh, I, I was, I was, we were not expected. And each and every time, in sites between 400 and 800 kilo years, we have uh, five or six different sites. We, we we have both, and each and every time it was it was it was right on. So it's it's pretty good, I guess. It's very good, especially it gives me confidence on the edge that have been done uh, in other parts of Europe where there is only this kind of uh, data available, chronological data. But the precision is accuracy. I mean, in terms of accuracy, okay. But the precision is probably yes. another magnitude below. Or something that, like that. That's that, that's a problem. That's why the Italian records uh, is is so useful because uh, the the framework is so nice and precise that you could really look at. The, the difference in age between sites, and you could really follow the evolution in time, instead of assuming that two sites uh, have the same age, and uh, sometimes it's not the case. Uh, with argon, argon, you could decipher sites which are apart by five or ten thousand years, which is completely impossible in the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. Even sites that are that are um, fifty thousand years apart could have equivalent age uh, from the radiometric point of view. And it's the fauna and other things that give you an idea if it's older or younger. But that could also be dangerous. And uh, your personal opinions about uh, 100,000 uh, kilo year gap in uh, archaeological sites? I have no idea. Uh, it's all over Europe. And even in sites where you have a, uh, uh, sometimes a, a record that go across this uh, this uh, this period, like in uh, at Apuerca, for instance, there is nothing between 800 and 700. Nothing, never. I never found one site which is dated from that period of time in Europe. There is maybe some, but it's it's there is really a gap in the record. If it if it's true or not, I have no idea. Anyway, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's recurrent. So and also this is a big divide by between uh, industry without uh, PFAS, I mean as a typical chopping tools and so on, and then comparison of BFAS. So it's also a big cultural gap. Yeah. I mean. For for that matter, uh, the fact that there is bifaces or indexes or not could be also just the fact that in that particular site it was not useful. Mm. Maybe yeah. they have the technology, but they don't use it for that particular things that they wanted to do in that particular site. So it's not because they were not here that they didn't have the ability to, to do it. So it's very dangerous also to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to use the fact that it's not there to say it was not there. Just because maybe the digging is not large enough to have found one piece of, uh, of uh, one on axe sometimes. So it's, uh, it, yeah, the absence of, uh, of something is not, it's not really a good, uh, a good, uh, good thing to rely on. And the fact that there is indexes that have been found before 800 kilo years mean that also it was there, but it was extremely rare, which is not the case after NES 17, where you find them more and more often. Extinction. So <laughs> maybe, maybe I, I don't know. So, are there any other questions? 
because in case, just for curiosity, I, I, I would like to ask uh, to Bernardo if, if you know how many people connected with the YouTube, but I, I want to, to, to thank the people also coming from other universities who connected uh, also from very far sides. And uh, uh, if there is no... 35 any on YouTube. Sorry? 35. 35, so which means, uh, oh, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a good audience at the end. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's more than 70 people. And uh, mm, so I, uh, mm, Sebastian, I thank you for... You're welcome. For this very interesting uh, webinar, also to uh, to use your afternoon of holiday in France <laughs> to dedicate uh, to us. I know I have to note uh, many other people in Europe as uh, as a holiday. Yes. Uh, today for the chansons, but of course not Italy. And uh, does not make any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I I would like to remember to the people is now still connected. Uh, there is a, a very active uh, uh, webinar activity of our department. It's possible to check uh, in our web, uh, page, in our web page. But also I recommend to you one of the next, uh, mm, there is not still uh, mm, a date, possibly half of, of June, but uh, really interesting. There is a Neil Roberts, one of the most, the most important uh, uh, scientists working on the climate and uh, uh, environmental evolution of the Mediterranean will be held a webinar in next week's. Uh, I don't know exactly the date we are we are discussing about it, and I think this is a very interesting uh, topic about changes in environment uh, in the Mediterranean, of course during the Holocene and uh, recent uh, late glacial and the changes in civilization. That's that's I think is, is a really really a very nice topic. So I hope. Uh, you will be connected in case, uh, and this is another nice opportunity the webinar can give us uh, to connect people around Europe, uh, uh, which is not possible usually with the traditional seminar uh, system. So I thank you again, uh, uh, Sebastian. You're welcome. And uh, I hope to meet you soon with the other friends now yes. connected, but somewhere. <laughs> okay. So okay. thank you very much. Bye-bye uh, to everybody. Bye. So